Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining. Um, we're really excited to have a truly global audience joining us on the webinar today, so thank you. We've got two moderators, uh, Stephen Raj, so UST Global's General Manager for APAC Region, and myself, I head up the retail practice here in the UK. I'll introduce our other speakers shortly, but just wanted to kick things off, provide some background to today's session. The session, as you can see, is badged, by, badged as how autonomous store technology enables business ROI and new retail opportunities. So the ongoing pandemic has <clears throat> really fundamentally changed customer behavior at, at an unprecedented scale that we've never seen before. It really feels like a, an adapt or perish approach and you know, retailers embracing these new shopping habits and technologies that support them are really going to be well positioned for a resilient future. Autonomous store tech is powered by AI, ML, and cutting edge sensor technologies, and is really helping retailers face into these challenges. And at the same time, ensuring that they get a return on their investments. Autonomous, <clears throat> autonomous store tech is gonna be discussed over the next 45 minutes, and our panel is going to be discussing how you know, forward thinking retailers are really starting to adopt low friction, low touch retail technologies that enrich customer experience and, and reduce costs, as well as understanding just how autonomous store technology is deployed and why it's generating a faster ROI. We're going to have an opportunity for Q&As at the end of the session, but you know, please don't wait. I'd encourage you all to uh, ask questions anytime via the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Our colleagues in the background are gonna be on hand to collate these ready for discussion at the end and may even answer some during the course of, of the webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to ask our presenters to introduce themselves. So if we could go to David uh, first, if you could introduce yourself, please, David. Yeah, thanks, John, and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, my name is David Dobson. I'm the Global Industry Director for Retail Hospitality and Consumer Goods uh, at Intel Corporation. So really happy to be here supporting our partners and listening to the uh, great conversation we have with our customers. Um, Dr. Nicholas, I think you're next on the list. If you could introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Nicholas Blumlein. Um, I work with the Schwartz Group, uh, specifically in the Schwartz Digital. We look at basically all kinds of technologies that might uh, improve some processes, be it in our stores or in the production facilities, in our warehouses, whatever. We take a look at these things and try to assess what uh, would improve our processes and then go ahead and start pilots, um, maybe implement the technology in a few, a couple of stores, et cetera, et cetera. So next one up is, according to my list, Mark. Hi everyone, this Mark. is Mark Perry from CloudPick and I'm the global business director. Um, CloudPick is an AI centric company focusing on computer vision. So. Um, you know, very happy to be here and thank you for having me. Casey? Uh, thanks, Mark. Hi, everybody. I'm Casey. I'm from Dairy Farm. Uh, I head up the business IT for the Dairy Farm Group, which is uh, mainly based in Asia across 11 markets. Um, other than business unit IT, I also head up supply chain and data analytics solutions for the group. I'm very happy to be uh, invited uh, to share and also to learn uh, from this uh, webinar. Um, thanks. Fabulous. <clears throat> Thank you all. Um, I'm going to now hand over hand you over to Stephen to kickstart the rest of the session. Stephen, over to you. Thanks so much, uh, John. Can can everyone hear me clearly? John. Okay. Great. Yep. We've got you. So, um, you know, welcome again, everyone. Uh, just, uh, you know, thank you so much for spending the time on the webinar. Um, so we'll just first start off with, um, you know, looking at the landscape in Asia Pacific. So if you look at Asia Pacific in terms of the retail scene, I mean, it's gone through a bit of a, you know, a transformation just over the years. And if you look at Asian Asia, there is no one Asia, right? So you've got, um, you know, a couple of countries that constitute about 80% of the grocery business, for example. Um, you know, you get the uh, Chinas, India, Japan, Indonesia, and South Korea who constitute that. Um, and from a um, perspective of, you know, how re consumer buying patterns have changed, uh, just like most of the world, um, over the years, there's been more that has been moving online. 
Um, and then with the, you know, with the recent onset of COVID, um, that has obviously skyrocketed just in terms of numbers. Um, as, as some of the countries are slowly coming, coming out of COVID, for example, in Singapore, the situation is, is getting more stable. And, you know, people are just flocking back to the physical stores, which is interesting, right? Uh, because in Asia also, um, you know, the social aspect of buying in a grocery store with other people around, it's almost therapeutic in a sense. Um, and But now with people going back to the grocery stores, um, uh, what they are actually looking for are richer digital experiences uh, because they have been become they've become so used to it uh, just just over this period. Um, with that, uh, it'll be interesting, uh, John, perhaps to hear what it's like out uh, in the UK. Yeah, absolutely, Stephen. So thank you. So the UK grocery industry has seen honestly some some gargantuan shifts in shopping habits in recent months with national lockdowns, regional lockdowns, driving people towards home delivery, click and collect, localized shopping. You know, that that impact of working from home, a need to socially distance, a general reluctance to touch things, um, has created really what I would describe as a donut effect. <clears throat> And hopefully everyone can see the graphic on the screen there. But our data scientists have been um, really working hard to understand the differences in the metros. And what's happening is that the neighbourhood stores and out-of-town shopping centres are seeing increased trade. And the city centres are really standing empty at the moment. And, and those graphs are showing the population change between 2019 and 2020 and really demonstrating that, that donut effect. However, that's not going to be around forever. Um, but I would like to call out that, you know, the grocers, particularly here in the UK, have done an amazing job of tactically supporting this shift while they juggle the cost, the people, the process, the demand, the supply chain challenges. And, you know, I think that's a real credit to how they've managed to, to move on a sixpence. There isn't really going to be a, you know, there isn't a post-COVID era yet, although we're clearly hopeful of one coming in the future. But what we'll see is a more digitally savvy consumer. Uh, customer experience is going to be about the demand for slick, easy, safe shopping experiences, regardless of store size, locality or channel. And, and some of the retailers have also started to um, you know, take some tactical approaches and some more strategic approaches as well. So we've seen, as well as building their own infrastructure and in-house capability, we've seen the formation of strategic partnerships with with online food delivery companies. And then from an in-store perspective, we've seen, yes, you've got Perspex safety screens and signage and you know cleaning regimes and all of that type of thing. But actually, we've got retailers deploying queuing applications, dedicated shopping times, use of apps with self-scan and self-checkout. But then some more innovative things like you know trials of e-bike, drone deliveries, robot deliveries. But the way I would sum it up is, the majority of those things are all, in essence, components of a frictionless future, which is quite exciting. So, um, David, just out of interest, what um, what do you see changing in North America and more broadly in Europe? Sorry, I was a little bit slow off mute there, so uh, apologies for that. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think you guys... Uh, characterize what's happening um, at a global level, really. A lot of the trends that you mentioned uh, we're also seeing in other parts of Europe and, and obviously in the US. Uh, rather than cover them again, I, I thought it might be just a good example or a good good way of, of illustrating this just to talk to a couple of the examples that you can see on the slide that were around a couple of themes that we're seeing um, um, uh, happen in the industry. So I, I think the first one, and, and I think John and Stephen, you both mentioned this, is it's kind of that reconfiguration of the physical store. Um, it, if the limited number of people can visit, um, if there's a drive of online, you know, what can you do to support that online biz business and how does the physical asset that you have, a store, a restaurant, um, whatever environment you, you're managing, how can that both support that online business and also maybe a, a fewer number of visitors in this sort of social distancing world that we're all living in at the moment? Um, so that's kind of one of the big themes and you know some of the customers on the slide are, are sort of uh, going about doing that um, those changes and I guess one of the ones I would highlight is, is Target. I think they've gone fairly public in terms of some of the work that they've been doing in this space and I think they they at last the last list said they've done made over 20 ch uh, changes to both the uh, operational um, 
systems to support their employees and, and also their shoppers. So it gives you an idea of, of the, the impact that um, you know, this, this thing that we're going through at the moment is having on them. And I think the second thing is, you, know, you, you mentioned about the growth in online. Uh, there continues to be some innovation in that space, and you know, social selling is getting a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of traction at the moment. And and can you create that physical social experience in an online environment? And uh, things like Debop that I've got on the slide here, which is a UK uh, company, are doing that extremely well, and and a lot of brands are playing with with that technology. But it's also driving a, a huge investment. I would say almost like a shift of some of the retail resources into that online fulfillment space. And uh, you know, you've got a lot of companies like Amazon and Walmart over in the US and others um, over here in Europe that are really reconfiguring some of their resources into supporting that online business um, away from their physical stores as they're closing and being um, uh, the physical capacity is being reduced. And then the kind of the final thing, and, and John, I think you mentioned this, is also people are not doing all of that and forgetting that actually people love to shop, right? So they're also looking at when we get back to a more normal situation, maybe in the start of next year, that experiential retail, the, you know, creating the desired locations for people to shop, there's still investment going on in that area. And, uh, you know, a couple of examples on here where people are still thinking about the environment, so uh, you know, refilling items, reusability, recycling is still a big theme that we're, we're hearing. And then the other area of curated experiences where um, we're seeing some of the stores um, start to set up um, environments that really attract people into their stores um, to get them back into that normal mode when, as you say, things go back to a more normal environment. So just a couple of trends with some customer examples on the slide there. Thanks so much, David. I think that was uh, that was very insightful. So uh, now we'll just switch over to Dr. Nicholas. So, Dr. so Nicholas, how is the uh, grocery supermarket uh, industry adjusting post-COVID? And specifically, I guess, in your world, uh, how are Little and Coughlin managing that change in uh, customer behavior? Yeah, so um, we are, generally speaking, as most grocery stores are considered essential and thus do not have to close their stores, we are in a pretty lucky situation. Um, on the other hand, this means that there's a lot of additional responsibility towards our customers and also our employees, and we, we don't want to expose them to additional health risks. So I think most of the stores uh, in Germany have implemented all these already mentioned non-digital measures like uh, these perspex uh, safety screens, uh, special signage, warning of, of uh, um, exposure and, and uh keeping the, the personal distances, etc. We have disinfection stations at every entrance and at the, the corrals for our trolleys. But besides, besides these, let's say, analog measures, um, we're always looking into new ways of, of leveling new technologies and, and finding innovative ways um, of how to use them in our stores or also in our production facilities or warehouses. Um, we, and that's probably why I'm in this call, in this webinar, um, we think that AI in, combi in combination with computer vision has in particular come a very long way in the last decade. And it allows for um, lots of automated solutions, new ideas on how to improve processes that have had to previously be handled by a human person. So that would be payment at the till, that would be um, analytics for customers uh, or of customers, theft preventions, and, and there's probably a lot of more uh, use cases. So in the current situation, um, we think that smart computer vision can be deployed in, in order to track compliance with these interpersonal distance rules. And if people are using maths or behaving in, in some non-compliant way, but we also think there's, there's a lot of new business models um, and I guess we will be talking about that a bit later on. So and aside from that, we're also continuously expanding and strengthening our, our online um, uh, offers and then the, our online shops. So that would be a rough overview of, of what we're doing right now. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Nicholas. Very, very uh, interesting uh, you know, trends that we're seeing in, in, in your part of the world and in, in your brands. So Casey, what about Dairy Farm, just out in Asia? What's, uh, what are the key changes you are witnessing and how is uh, Dairy Farm adjusting to that? 
Yeah, thanks, Stephen. So um, in Singapore, where I'm based in, uh, we have uh, kind of uh, implemented quite a fair bit of uh, safety measure in stores. Uh, that includes uh, temperature taking before customers go into stores. And also um, having this uh, safe entry uh, to kind of uh, trace you know, who entered the stores. So these are some of the measures that uh, we, we, we do to ensure that we provide a, a safe uh, environment for the customers. Uh, in, in some segments, uh, customer segments such as the senior uh, shoppers, we even have a dedicated um, one hour where uh, only seniors and the needy can shop because then uh, they don't have to uh, queue up with the other able shoppers. So some of these um, um, measures is really to, to offer a safe environment for our customers. Uh, but other than that, you know, uh, we also step out the uh, essential uh, stock level. So we kind of uh, uh, pay attention to this essential stock list. We uh, up the replenishment level. We increase the replenishment level in stores as well, just to make sure that essential items such as uh, rice, pastas, is always available uh, available on the shelf. Uh, in in terms of checking out in stores, we also have increased uh, the number of checkout points um, over this period, uh, primarily because we want to reduce the the queuing time from the customers. So we have deployed quite a fair bit of self checkouts, and we also uh, see an increase of card payments, um, and customer you know uh, choosing to use a card to pay rather than to use cash to pay. So these are some of the um, experience uh, that we have uh, put in place. And of course, uh, sanitizing the checkout points, uh, making sure that it is safe and clean. Those are the new routines uh, regime that we put in the stores. The other area that is very obvious is on the online space. You know, we see uh, increasing uh, demand where customers will want to have option to purchase online, uh, to pick up in stores, or to deliver to their homes. So during this period as well, we have stepped up the capacity to fulfill online orders, uh, either uh, through uh, home delivery or increasing the um, uh, click and collect uh, points across our store network in Singapore. So these uh, trends that we see here in Singapore is also um, observed in uh, other markets like um, uh, Hong Kong um, and Malaysia as well. So it's, it's really uh, putting in a safe um, and a clean environment for the shoppers in stores, uh, opening up more checkout points for them to you know, speed up the checkouts and offering more online options uh, for customers to shop with us. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Casey. I think uh, that's interesting trends that we're seeing in Asia. And, and I think you also mentioned, you know, just, just being very uh, cognizant of the older shopper, you know, cash still being around and things like that. It's great that online and, and credit credit card based spending and all that is going up. Wonderful. So with that, uh, you know, what about China, Mark? Uh, can you share some perspectives about China? What's your experience of what's changing or adjusting in China? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for asking. So it's actually quite interesting because, um, you know, pa the pandemic is a is awful thing. Um, a lot of countries are going through the hardship. And frankly speaking, I think, you know. China is probably, you know, one of the few countries that has, you know, pretty much reached the post-COVID um, situation phase, I would say, because, you know, we, we, we've been through a lot of hardships at the beginning. And um, so, as you can see in the slide, um, uh, we, we took a lot of precautions, you know, back in Jan uh, February at the first quarter of 2020. Uh, everything that you um, the, the pa other panelists have mentioned just now, we have taken the same measures: social distancing, um, thermometers, checking temperatures between uh, before entering uh, uh, enclosed uh, uh, environment. Including, um, you know, we, we also have this uh, card where it's a an app, it's an application um, embedded in WeChat where people and, and at Alipay where people um, you know it literally tracks your movements between cities and provinces. And if you have ever been to a hot zone. In the past, you know, seven days or whatever, it will show as red, meaning that you are uh, restricted to, from going to a lot of places. You know, so we have been through a lot of, you know, social restrictions, and uh, whilst, um, you know, whilst we were in that phase, you know, we we had a lot of, you know, uh, 
changings in in behavior, social behaviors, and shopping behaviors. So you know, uh, uh, cashless stores, autonomous stores. You know, that's where we're focused at. Um, definitely, you know, this was kind of opportunity for us. We also, um, as you can see at the at the picture on on, on the top row, we also use um, we had to develop this technology where we embed a monitor and a facial recognition in the in the pad. Um, which is built into the speed gate because um, when people are scanning the QR code, although the store is completely cashless and non-contact, but to ensure the environment is virus, virus free, we also um, used a small embedded a monitor to make sure every entrant is, you know, okay to go in. And also through facial recognition, we want to detect if this person is wearing a mask and if he's not, the gate will not open for him. Right. That's, that's what we did um, in some of our stores. And uh, some other social behaviors, such as you know, uh, as you know, the Chinese delivery uh, system is very well built. But before, you know, people could uh, the the takeaway guys they can deliver to your doorstep. But then, during the pandemic, people were basically dropping it at the at the gate of the compound. And um, you know, the, the whole essence is non-contact, right? You you leave it at the gate of compound, and whoever's ordering the takeaway, that you have to come down from your household to, to take it. And then we had a um, huge surge in such um, the, the yellow box that you see on the bottom right, um, which is, you know, um, placed, uh, uh, help yourself deliveries, where, you know, if you, instead of takeaways or food, when you order stuff from, you know, online uh, platforms or online shops, they will deliver, instead of to a household, they will deliver to this, uh, you know, help yourself pick up box. So basically, and I think some of the, some of the um, things I can share with you guys is actually, um, you know, what happens after, maybe after the pandemic, right? Because although that we still in China, we still have a few, a couple of cases here and there, um, and it's causing a lot of trouble and and, and anxiety in this uh, in the society. But at least I can say that, you know, after this this pandemic is somewhat of a um, trigger or a a a, a um, you know a, a very very random situation where it actually induces people to to go online and to to shift their lifestyles to the online practices um a day a statistic i want to share with you is that um you know after the grocery right after 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 the pandemic 70 percent of people under 80 uh, under 30 years old choose to stay online right so they have to completely change their their social behavior because of this situation, right? So it's very interesting to see, you know, obviously this pandemic has brought us a lot of trouble, but it's really interesting to see how, what kind of, you know, impact it has brought to the social environment and where people shop. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mark. And I think <clears throat> based on what we've heard from KC, Mark, Nicholas and David, it's fair to just very quickly summarize. So first off, <laughs> I think it's fair to say as shoppers are seeking local, easier, safer shopping experiences, it's probably the contactless automation, um, the always on stores that will provide this experience and and ultimately, you know, help those retailers be more successful in acquiring and retaining their customers. Secondly, uh, the role of C stores, I think, will become even more um, you know, it can be even greater as they help to reassure what is, in essence, a, a fairly cautious consumer that shopping in their stores is not only providing them value and convenience, but also a, a safe and seamless shopping experience. And then lastly, I think, you know, the consumer demands and, you know, indeed the, the principle of localization. It, it isn't just about shopping close to home. It's about the shopping experience where wherever a significant population or footfall exists. So, you know, take, for example, the, the transit hubs, such as airports or train stations, as well as places like universities, hospitals, large head offices even. You know, the consumer demands in those places are really no different. So we'll, we'll explore a little bit more about that shortly. So if we just... If we just take a step back a second, so what about if you could give your customers a frictionless shopping experience accessible anytime, day or night, with you know entry via an app, a QR code, a credit card, or cash, allow them to shop, and then simply leave. You know, simply walk out, trigger automatic payment, uh, generate a receipt to their their mobile phone. Um, that would that would surely be utopia and 
of interest to those consumers and retailers alike. John, that sounds wonderful. So can you tell us a little bit about what UST Global Cloud Pick are doing to help the customers in this kind of in this new world, this new normal? Yeah, David, it's it's great actually. So you know, we've spent uh, you know we've had a two year partnership with Cloud Pick now, and we've been bringing autonomous store solutions to the market across the globe for that two years. And you know, we're now bringing it here in the UK, which is super exciting. Um, the solution uses Intel OpenVINO toolkit based AI tech, uh, very close to your heart, David. Um, it also uses IoT devices multiple sensors, uh, including sort of weight and load sensors, and edge computing as well. So really cutting edge uh, tech, all in tandem with customer store-facing applications, really helping transform, as you mentioned earlier, those bricks and mortar stores into the new age of digital stores. So um, it's a really exciting time. And I've actually got a couple of videos to help bring that to life. So. Um, got two videos to share. The first one is from earlier this year at NRF in New York, um, when we were able to go out pre pre pandemic, if you like. And then the second one from a client who's already embarked upon their autonomous store journey with us. So um, we'll play those videos back to back. And then I'll hand over to Stephen to to walk you through some more of the solution. But um, sit back, watch the videos and enjoy. Thank you. Really excited to be here for NRF 2020. We're here with the frictionless customer shopping experience. With this customer experience, you have three simple steps. The first is scan to get into the store, then get your items as you always would, and simply walk out of the store. We had worked with the best provider in artificial intelligence to look at how we can have a seamless customer shopping experience, bringing together multiple technical components to have a best-in-class solution to, so they can simply walk in the store, get the items that they want, and leave. We've rolled out two locations in the U.S. We were able to come in and go live at the store in as little as six weeks. It's been a huge success in those two stores within office buildings. What's really exciting, we look at this as an opportunity for a new business model or putting food in places that we've never done business before. Thank you, and we look forward to building our next store with you. Hi, my name is Ken Bullock. I'm the head of IT innovation for Retail Business Services. I'm Paul Scores, and I'm the chief information officer for Retail Business Services. This is our future of frictionless shop. We've termed this project Project Lunchbox. You simply scan your way to enter the store, grab your items, and walk out. We can have numerous shoppers within a small area shopping the store and walking out, still expecting to be charged accurately for their orders. You can shop in a matter of seconds. After we have saw the best combination of technologies available. We've used IT teams internally, our innovation labs, as well as partners, including UST Global. There are comparable solutions out there. Our philosophy on innovation is to be what we call a fast follower. Let somebody else maybe go do that, and then we can very fast implement very quickly for a much lower cost. Ultimately, what sets this technology apart from others on the market is we can do it faster and cheaper. The product offering here is targeting convenience for lunch, but adding that fresh quality of food that you can't easily get from a vending machine. I uh, use Lunchbox every day. Uh, I come down and get uh, soda water, a pack of gum, or any other convenience item. This is absolutely a lifesaver. I'm always struggling to get food into me during the day, and I'm able to do that here pretty quickly. It's great, you know, a busy day, and you just come in and out, and you're done, because this is really cutting edge, and you're going to see this more and more. Being able to get whatever you want whenever you want it just makes everything easier. Here at Retail Business Services, we deliver innovation. What this does here is really focus focuses on convenience for people. Pick up what you want, you turn right around and walk out. So very convenient, very quick. The lunchbox revolutionizes lunch. Yeah, so I hope those videos uh, give everyone, uh, you know, a very good feel of what it actually feels like on the ground to have, you know, one of these futuristic experiences.
So what I'll do is that I will uh, just walk through a bit more details about the solution, what's under the hood. Um, so if you think about, you know, uh, the walk-in, walk-out, you know, store concept or, you know, or frictionless shopping, as it's called uh, in a broader sense, essentially it, it just covers, you know, four main types of technologies, right? So firstly, we've got uh, cameras and sensors uh, that are mounted, um, you know, all across the store. They're able to track shoppers where they're moving with pinpoint accuracy. And then we've got specially fitted uh, smart racks. I mean, these racks are capable of, you know, sensing when someone has picked up a certain item off a shelf or when they put it back. Um, and then obviously before someone leaves the store, uh, you know, you got to obviously know which, at, at which point is who leaving the store, right? So there's a frictionless exit uh, technology that's in place as well. And then uh, finally, of course, as you're leaving the store, it's important to collect your money. Uh, and we've got, you know, as part of the technology and the fit outs, we've got various forms of how, you know, payment can be uh, facilitated as well. Uh, most of it, obviously, uh, cashless. And if you look at, um, you know, what the experience is like from a customer perspective, um, at the heart of the experience is actually an app, right? Uh, and and if, you, if, you look, if you look at some of the larger retailers, a lot of them also have their own current loyalty apps for their customers. So, uh, so what we can do is that we can embed uh, some of the technologies uh, necessary to support this uh, frictionless store, walk-in, walk-out store uh, uh, technology through, through embedding our uh, capabilities within the existing apps. Or if, if, the, if, uh, if our client doesn't have a uh, app of their own, uh, USC also has a out-of-the-box app that can be configured uh, for, uh, for the use of, uh, of the client, eventually, of course, of their customers. Uh, from a payment perspective, it's all touch and go, you know, very simple uh, to just, uh, you know, pay for whatever you purchase, QR code technology is used. And in Asia, uh, as Casey mentioned, I mean, cash is still used uh, in, in many parts of Asia. So that doesn't stop the digital experience for, for these customers. And we've also got technologies which can take payment uh, through, through cash as well. And from a um, implementation and, and bringing this whole service to market perspective, um, you know, from a USD perspective, we can, we, I mean, it's a one-stop shop with us uh, and we work with uh, some of our specialist partners in this. So, you know, the, the whole, you know, the whole journey of the implementation actually starts with a site survey. Uh, we'll kind of look at, you know, what kind of stores you have, what kind of store that you have, uh, what size, what configuration, and from there we make certain decisions about the implementation. Um, the, uh, the implementation itself, um, you know, is done fully by USD um, uh, together with our partners. Uh, and that also uh, the, the whole implementation cost also covers end-to-end -end with hardware and software, all of the store fixtures and equipment that you need. So you don't really need to provide a lot on your own. Everything is provided by us. Uh, it's also fully project managed by USD as a one-stop shop. Um, as, and, and after you go live, um, you know, and, and what day two operations and, and the level of service quality is, is of course, very important uh, when you're in the grocery business uh, or convenience store business and you're trying to provide, you know, the, the great service over the years that your customers have been used to. So that should not stop after you go digital, uh, which is why we've got expert support uh, services uh, to, uh, to make sure that whenever you have a problem with your stores, we're there to, to, to help out and, and fix it as quickly as possible. Uh, and then, of course, from an end user perspective, like I mentioned, there are, um, you know, there are various applications that will complement this. One is the app for the actual customer, and then the other one is uh, apps that are also used by the retailers to track things like inventory and all of that. So I hope that that gives you, um, you know, a pretty good feel of what this end-to-end -end proposition is from USD uh, for this uh, walk-in, walk-out concept. So with that, maybe we'll get some perspectives from Mark about. Uh, you know, the examples or the kinds of stores that have been opened, uh, Mark, uh, using some of these technologies. Yeah, thank you. So um, in terms of stores that has been opened, um, in a total summary, we have opened up to almost 100 stores um, using uh, autonomous computer vision technology around the world, right? And with the great help of UST, through UST, we have opened up, you know, they have done a very, very good job. In, uh, in helping us to, de to develop the U.S. market and the, and the European market. So as you can see, um, um, the, the stores opened up in Quincy, uh, Carlisle, including um, NRF exhibition um, stores, as well as the store in upcoming store in Germany. 
um, very well um, developed markets together with UST. And in terms of, you know, outside these areas, we also have opened up stores in, in China, more than, um, so in, collectively speaking, we have stores in, in 11 different countries, um, you know, Singapore, China, uh, Japan, Korea, Myanmar, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and I think what some of the commonly seen uh, scenarios or or um, locations where our stores are most applicable would be, you know, uh, society, uh, social communities, uh, CBD areas, uh, transit hubs, including, um, you know, I think CBD uh, is actually one of the most profitable places, as well as um, campuses, school campuses, or um, industrial parks. So these are the very commonly seen places where our stores will be located. Um, Stephen, you mentioned the implementation process. Can you can you take us through that process a bit? Yeah, sure. So just from a, you know implementation process, it's actually a, a very easy um, you know methodological you know seven step process that we have. Um, so as you can read the slide, you know everything from you know what kind of a user experience you want to have to how do you want to do your customer registrations, you know choosing the payment gateways. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, there's some level of integration that needs to happen as well. Our product as assortment is also something that we work closely with our clients on because I think as you look at, um, you know, employing technologies like this, it also presents new possibilities of uh, new types of business models, right, or new product assortment, assortments that can be brought to market to complement the existing business. And finally, we also work with, um, you know, the existing, um, you know, fit-out teams in terms of you've got, you know, your own, uh, fit out teams with a certain look and feel that you're designing your stores for. We work very closely with them as well to make sure that the technology further complements uh, the visual appeal that, that your customers have been used to. Hey, Stephen, it's, it's David again. So could you explain a little bit more about the product assortment? I know you called that out in the seven step process. So yeah, could you talk a little bit more about that for me, please? Yeah, sure. Sure, David. So from a product assortment perspective, um, I think the, it is actually very wide in terms of the types of product assortment uh, that we support. So, you know, we do everything from, you know, uh, chilled and frozen foods, obviously the usual groceries, even fresh fruits are, or vegetables are not excluded from being, track, being trackable by the technology. You know, things even like coffee, liquor, and even hot food, right? And, and we saw some of that as well in some of the videos. So really, you know, um, you know a very wide, uh, range of uh, product assortment that can be supported by the technology and and very few limiting factors in, in, in what you can go to market with with your with your customers yeah Stephen, this is really interesting actually over in dairy farm we have different type of stores we have small format grocery stores we have convenience stores and also some uh, convenience stores with cafe so just thinking maybe john are you able to just uh, let kind of share a little bit on uh, what you can support today? Yeah, it's a good question, actually. So, you know, we were able to support all of the, the store formats that you've just mentioned. So, you know, whether that's small grocery, C stores, C stores with cafe, um, we can support all of those. And actually, from a store size perspective, we can comfortably cover everything from, say, 250 square foot through to 10,000 square foot. The only thing I'd say is that, you know, the, probably the most critical consideration is is location. And I think, you know, we've covered that during the, the, the webinar today. But, you know, location is absolutely critical. But, uh, yeah, 250 to 10,000 square foot. So hopefully that, that answers the question. Um, John, you t know that we're talking about location. You mentioned, or I think it was you or, or Mark, um, transit hubs, office buildings, universities, etc. But these are already built infrastructure. Uh, do you have any any offering that goes into these kind of places? Some kind of retrofitting? Yeah. So yeah, we've we've got what we classify as, and this is a mouthful, but uh, it's called WeWo Mini, and um, WeWo stands for Walk In, Walk Out. So uh, we will mini is our, as it says on the tin, you know, mini frictionless solution. It's deployable in, in the locations you mentioned. So, you know, those transit hubs, office buildings, universities uh, type locations. Um, and it's also available, as you can see, via a, a shipping container style pop-up. Um, and, and I'm sure you can see from the images, but it, it looks pretty impressive. The SKU capacity is around 
you know, three to 400, depending on product mix. And, you know, there's also an opportunity here to, you know, commercialize this solution as well. So take, for example, temperature controlled lockers uh, attached to the outer wall of WeWo Mini. Um, you could make them accessible to Grubhub and Deliveroo and other delivery companies, and then really give your customer another reason to, to visit WeWo Mini, pick up their not only their dinner and their staples at the same time. So, yeah, this is this is a great solution. And, um, you know, it's quite drag and drop in many respects. So, uh, yeah, great question, Nicholas. Thank you. Uh, very interesting, John. Um, actually, for um, dairy farm, if or maybe a client, right? If somebody, you know, a client decided to go with this, right? How long does it take uh, for, for you know, this store to be uh, launched? Don't know whether uh, Stephen can um, kind of share a little bit more. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Casey. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a great question, right? Because, you know, you look at all the great technology, you're wondering, is it going to take forever to get, you know, some of this market? So the reality is that actually we can deliver this whole project uh, in 10 weeks or less, obviously with you know prerequisites being met. And the way we do it is because a lot of the components of what it takes to go to market actually kind of prefabricated, they're pre-configured. So with that, it actually really, really reduces the time to market, reduces the risk of delivery, and we can do it in 10 weeks or less, right, depending on the client and, and the format. That's awesome, Stephen. So uh, now we get to the... Final question, well, not the final question of the session, but the key question, which is cost, return on investment. Do you want to give us some idea of um, some facts or figures in that space? Yeah, so so thanks uh, for that question. I, I think everyone, is, now that's the next, uh, like you called it, right, the elephant in the room. How much is this going to cost? <laughs> is, it money? is it going to cost me more money, right? So I think yeah. firstly, let's, uh, before we answer the ROI question, let's look at the uh, pricing models, right? Um, so from a pricing model perspective, uh, we're very flexible. Uh, we do realize sometimes stores operate off the P&Ls of individual stores, and, and that's how cost is allocated. So, so we can either do a CapEx, you know, and then a monthly fee. Uh, we can also do a full OPEX model, uh, depending on, um, you know, the needs of, of the client. Uh, and interestingly, we're also starting to see models where, you know, we are also responding to our clients' needs to price by transactions, right, uh, for, for their business. Uh, so that the variability is taken care of. So, so really very flexible, uh, I think, in terms of the uh, commercial models. And um, if we were to just move on uh, to the next slide. And just from a, from a general ROI perspective, um, you know, once you spend this money on this technology, the question is, um, you know, what is going to pay for this extra, so-called extra investment, right? So let's 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 you know I'll just you know kind of be quite transparent about it. The cost of actually fitting out uh, one of these stores is usually about 1.5 to two times the cost of a regular store fit out because you're putting cameras and smart shelves and smart racks and all of that. Uh, but that is more than you know taken care of um, by the reduction that we are seeing in payroll costs of up to about 60 percent. We are seeing a reduction in losses, right, that you normally get in a physical store because yeah, it's. It's harder to steal something, let's put it that way, right? So 75% uh, reduction in uh, unknown losses. Um, and we are also seeing that uh, all of this basically translates to a, uh, an increase in gross profit net margins of more than 30%, which is more than enough to pay for some of these technologies. So really, the technology pays for itself. And in the longer run, it actually uh, is a, a huge improvement uh, to the bottom line. So I hope that uh, that answers the questions of everyone who's thinking about cost and is this thing going to pay for itself, yeah? So maybe, um, I guess, John, um, over back to you. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, there's, a, there's a few things to, that's worthy of adding to that uh, commentary, actually. And, uh, you know, you've given a great overview, but I think that um, it's worthy of mentioning that uh, ROI tends to come probably even quicker in the small stores. So I've gone back to the WeWo mini slide. Um, so those stores that are deployed in transit hubs and universities. I think, you know, what we've seen is you're going to get a return on investment quicker than you'd get anywhere else. And the reason, there's two reasons for that. One is that um, in transit hubs, you know, 
people are desperate to accelerate that shopping experience, get in, get out. You know, if you're in Canary Wharf in London, then all you want to do is have the, the quickest route to getting that lunch and, and, and getting it eaten. Um, and equally in university spaces, you know, there, there's a really high adoption because of that, you know, Gen Z uh, populace, if you like, and, and therefore their embracing of that technology is giving a, a huge appetite to use that store. So the ROI comes even quicker. Um, we've touched on it already, the, the monetization and commercialization of some of these units. You know, we talked about temperature control lockers, but actually there's also parallel revenue streams around things like uh, external and internal, you know, brand advertising, sponsorship opportunities um, through screens and additional fixturing and marketing material. Um, and, and that goes a long way to offsetting some of the associated costs for, for We Will Mini. So there's another there's another great example of how to um, you know bridge that delta, and then and then finally, uh, this will probably come up in Q and A, but I'll answer it anyway in advance. Um, there's lots of uh, potential clients asking about retrofitting options, and you know whilst. Many of our customers want to build stores from the ground up, these frictionless stores from the ground up. Lots are asking about, you know, how we take a current live store and make it frictionless. So we do have a retrofitting option. We work directly with uh, a client's manufacturers uh, for, you know, shelving, gondolas, racks, um, whether it be ambient or chilled. And then we embed the technology directly into the shelving and the cabinets so that, you know, the core fixtures can remain. And that's a really that's an that's another really good way of uh, driving down some of the costs. Uh, but again, in the first instance, most people tend to build from ground up and then and then move to retrofitting further down the line. So, I just thought it was worth jumping in there and, and adding some flavour to that. So, um, I think before we go to Q and A, um, it would be great to hear some final thoughts from our panelists and see what their takeaways from the session were. So, um, if everyone's okay with that, Nicholas, can I come to you first for your thoughts? Absolutely, John. Thank you. Um, so the, I saw this, this Vivo Mini concept and I, I really love the, the looks and feel of it. And um, I think the whole idea of having a micro hub in combination with maybe locker station stations is a, is a great idea to combine the online with the offline sales. So you could order some packages and, and then get them there and grab maybe a snack uh, while, you, while you're already there. And uh, also makes you very independent of, of any times of the day. So um, that that model itself lends itself to, to a lot of new possibilities. So I think I'm thinking you could have it as a standalone new store concept. Uh, you could have a store in store or you could have it like a, a backing up a, an, an existing store. And um, if you combine that with a highly localized assortment, um, that would be could be a very interesting 24-7 shopping option for many customers. And um, with UST in particular, we, we see that they offer um, great services at a reasonable price, which uh, I, we, we, kind of, we are still taking a look at all kind of different vendors and uh, UST s sticks out uh, as being very reasonably priced. So I think that they are, offer a very attractive um, portfolio for grocers who like us to have little experience with AI based computer vision technology and, and want to uh, level leverage that for their business model. That's great feedback. Thank you. And uh, Mark, can I come to you next? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, um, you know, again, since cloud pick, you know, we're focused with AI company, we're focused on the computer vision technology and but what, what what I would like to emphasize or you know leave as a takeaway point is that you know we're our intention and our target is much more than that. You know, uh, building this uh, cashless store or frictionless store is the foundation or the cornerstone of the um, ecosystem of the environment that we intend to build, right? So some of the other things that we are already uh, offering and um, uh, are, are are things like you know in-store interactive adverts our personalized adverse marketing campaign, you know, things like this that enables our retailers to have a full control and more grasp of, of their operations. And things that that's we have on our roadmap are things like, you know, uh, uh, order and come to store pickup, self pickup, 
or or in, uh, something that Nicholas, Dr. Nicholas has just mentioned, you know, online to offline um, mergers where, you know, uh, your data from online can be used offline or activities offline in the real uh, uh, autonomous store can be also used online in the online stores, as well as, you know, in integration with other ecosystems such as takeaways, right, where um, at least in China, we can see that a lot of um, people after the pandemic that, you know, they're so used to using the online platforms, they, they, they would even go through the, you know, online ordering process and order maybe a soap, things like tissue, right, and get it delivered to your home doorstep within half an hour, you know, they're just so used to this kind of uh, third party services. So this is another uh, integration that we're looking at adopting as well in our ecosystem. So, you know, again, we're, we're focusing much, much more than just pr creating this um, cashless uh, shopping environment. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're here to build and, and we're making our available ourselves available to a lot of options. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Mark. Um, David, can I come to you? Yeah, sure. Thank, thanks, John, and thanks to the team. I mean, it, just um, it's been a great discussion, and it's really interesting. Always interesting to hear from customers, but I think um, you know all of us on the call. I think it's been a very interesting discussion today. A uh, couple of takeaways for me, you know, frictionless. Um, I know uh, the centerpiece of this presentation has been around you know, the UST Global WeMo solution and, and what you can do in that space, but there's kind of other things that are frictionless as well, like lockers, like um, you know, easy to use uh, scanning and, and uh, checkout systems. So we're starting to see many more solutions in that space, which is great. Um, and we're also seeing the maturity of those solutions in the market, right? So the cost is coming in the right direction for retailers, which is down. Uh, the proven solution that the there's a large number of deployments, so it's kind of reliable technology. So all of that is, is shows the maturity. I think the other two themes and, and something that we hear a lot about at Intel that's uh, super in important in this space is, you know, especially in today's environment, safe uh, solutions, safe for you know, your shoppers, but also for your employees. So anything that addresses that safety issue is going to be super important and frictionless, got a, a really significant um, play in that space. And then the other thing is about flexibility, right? So we, who knows how things are going to change and what we're going to face in the next six months. So having a, a degree of flexibility is going to be super important uh, moving forward as well. So, um, and, and I think solutions that address uh, those two areas are going to be key for retailers. Um, um, so just a, f a few summary points and, and uh, things to think about for the next phase. Thank you, David. I, I think the, the points, particularly around those those other frictionless solutions as well, really, really valid. So thank you. Um, Casey, last but not least, can I come to yourself? Oh, thanks, John. I, I, I really learned uh, a lot today, you know, uh, knowing that this, uh, you know, technologies are already available today and the adoption is increasing uh, in, in different parts of the world. So, um, I mean, my takeaway is that, you know, at least I have learned something. This uh, WeMo um, solution does address two of the biggest uh, issues, uh, problems that uh, retailers face. First is rental. You know, this uh, WeMo allows these small format stores. You know, another way, uh, interesting technology-enabled way to operate. And then secondly, uh, labor costs. You know, uh, today we are relying on labor to run a shop, but uh, with this technology, both the rental and the labor costs uh, can be addressed. I think that presents a very interesting proposition uh, for retailers. Thank you. Thank you, KC, much appreciated. And thank you to all our panelists today as well. Um, your, your time might, might not be finished yet, though. We've got some questions and answers uh, to, to do now. So uh, without further ado, let me... Um, pull up the first question we've got from our audience today. Um, so the first one was around, what's the largest size we've opened? Uh, so we've opened a 3,000 square foot store, um, but we can do up to 10,000 as we previously mentioned. But I think the important thing to mention here is that the technology is you know, evolving all of the time. So we see a world where you know, within the next two years, we could potentially open stores bigger than 10,000 square foot as well. So I think, um, yeah, the future is bright, but at the moment, the biggest store that we've opened is 3,000 square foot. Uh, let me take the next question. Um. 
Yeah, okay, so the next question is, sorry for the pause, I was just finding it. Um, how many concurrent customers can you support? So the, the, the easy answer to this is uh, the general thumb rule, I would say, is about one per 10 square foot. So if you've, um, you know, if you've got 500 square foot store, then um, it's easy to support uh, 50, 50 concurrent customers. So um, that's, the, that's the answer in a nutshell. Let me see if we've got any more questions. Yeah, there was a there was a question here about um, what happens to employees when friction of the store is implemented. So we've again we've talked about indicative labour cost reduction of around about 60%. And I think it's really important to face into these types of questions. Um, we, we haven't seen uh, an implementation where there has been any uh, loss of colleagues or um, they, they've simply been shifted to different, sometimes more strategic um, and sometimes different, uh, more exciting roles. Um, so this is about taking the pure operational cost out of what they're doing, but actually the opportunities that the business has in other spaces have uh, allowed those colleagues to keep their roles and apportion that payroll into different lines on a P&L. So, um, yeah, the payroll saving exists from an operational perspective and, and moves to do more strategic activities in the main. Um, and actually things like uh, store managers, um, you end up seeing store managers operating three, four or five frictionless stores within a cluster to support that. And that feels like it's a really exciting career development as opposed to something negative. So, um, yeah, we, we think that that's a, a positive move as opposed to a, a negative move. I think we've covered off most of the other questions that I can see from the Q&A. Um, Stephen, can you see any that I haven't picked up on? Um, no, I think um, I think those are the main questions. Uh, <clears throat> John, and maybe just to add to your point as well about, uh, there's always this question about employees and, and you know, are people gonna be losing jobs and all that. I think if you look at a country like Singapore, for example, uh, labor is something that sometimes, it's hard to find people who wanna do these jobs for a reasonable salary, right? Um, and uh, and I think uh, uh, and I think you know when, when businesses want to expand very quickly, uh, this this provides an alternative way to expand from an expansion perspective rather than a am I going to get rid of people type perspective. I think the other thing is that just with the whole COVID um, uh, challenge that we've all been through, uh, contactless is becoming the 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 way to go, right? Uh, and I think with these stores, um, you know, a lot of the experience is contactless. Uh, and I think that presents a new way of how people would like to interact with uh, store operators as well, right? Where they don't need to deal with humans, deal with cash. Um, so that's that's something that even governments are pushing for. So I just wanted to add that perspective as well as we look forward on the technology rather than, uh, 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 and, and of course the concerns are real, but uh, but I think we are seeing very good reasons why, why stores are transforming to this manner. Thank you, Stephen. And and we're just about to finish the session today, so it leaves me to say thank you very much for joining. Thank you for listening. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, and you can see the slides on the slide on the screen. Please reach out to us if you'd like to speak to us about this further. We look forward to the conversation. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Bye.